Hey, Spencer. Hey, Julia. I wanted to ask you about a question that used to bug me a lot when I studied economic development. I did a little bit of research in economics and especially in economic development. So there are some questions that are really f that have a, a fundamental fundamental impact on how you should lead your life or how you should conduct your career, how you should think about the world, but they're so tricky that you end up just sort of packaging them up in a box and putting them away in a corner of your mind because they're just so hard to resolve. And one of those questions um, applied to my work in economic development. So the, the goal of economic development is to make people materially better off, um, but that's sort of a, the intermediate goal. The, the end goal uh, is to make people happier, to improve people's well-being. And so the tricky question that I kept boxing up was, how do we actually measure people's happiness? Because in order to, to accomplish this endeavor with any kind of rigor, to be confident that you're doing it right, you're headed in the right direction, you have to be able to measure happiness, at least relatively speaking. To, you know, Otherwise, you won't be able to say you know, that making people materially better off actually does make them happier. You, you have to be able to quantify it. So uh, I th thought to start off, we should talk about how do you, like literally, how do you try to measure people's happiness? So uh, the, the one sort of common tactic that researchers would use is just to ask people, like to rate their happiness on a scale of one to 10, say, which is kind of problematic for a, a bunch of reasons. For one thing, it's not clear that the same number, like if I say I'm a five and you say you're a five, that we're actually equally happy, right? Yeah, I think probably everyone has a different idea of what a five is. Right. It's not, I mean, some people might say, oh, five, that, that's average, right in the middle. Right. Whereas other people may think think back to their grade school and say, oh, five, that's like a failing. And, you know, I, I'm not a failing. I'm more like a 90%. Right. So. Uh, uh, a related problem if you if you're talking to someone about whether a girl is like you know a, a nine or a ten you know you're like rating how hot she is um i've noticed people use totally different distributions of hotness for this rating like most people don't uh think that there are that 10 percent of the women in the population are tens they use 10 very sparingly 10 it's more of a bell curve like 10 would be like way out in the tail of the of the bell curve Anyway, I feel like that's relevant, mm -hmm. <laughs> that people probably use different distributions mm -hmm. um, of happiness when they're thinking about where on the curve they fall. Absolutely. And even if you did, I mean, and it also is problematic because if you found out that the a population has an average of a seven, mm -hmm. uh, you don't even know what that means. I mean, what have you actually measured? I mean, are they happy or are they not? I don't know. Right. So uh, another alternative to the number scale would be to ask people in words like not, not just a totally open-ended question, but um, have a scale where instead of numbers, you have sort of descriptions like um, moderately happy or, um, or content or, uh, or extremely happy or et cetera. But that's also problematic, right? Yeah. I mean, this leads to questions about how do you measure happiness across cultures? Mm -hmm. And it does seem to improve on the number system within one culture. But then when you're going across cultures, you have to say, okay, how do we translate each of these words? Right. I mean, moderately happy. How do we translate that into Japanese? And how do we choose exactly the right word to modify happiness that, to say moderately such that Japanese people feel that moderately is just as strong as our moderately? Right. That's it, really tricky. And I mean, it, translation in general is an imperfect art. We don't even necessarily have we definitely don't have corresponding words for all of the concepts and feelings and and levels of magnitude of those feelings that that we would need to form these exact correspondences. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're translating literature, it doesn't have to be exact, you know. But if, if this makes a difference between a, a result in one direction versus a result in another direction in your study, those, that, that slight, you know, shade of meaning could make all the difference in your results, and it's just an issue of translation. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Another thing that I, I think is really interesting about people evaluating their happiness is sort of what over what time frame are you thinking about your happiness right like mm -hmm. you could be you could be thinking about your happiness um or you could you could ask someone how happy they are like right now like right now how happy do you feel or you could ask someone over the last week how happy were you roughly right so this is the issue of happiness in experience and happiness in memory and mm -hmm. as it turns out they can be extremely different if you ask people how happy were you over the last week 
they may report something very different than if you were to say text message them at random times throughout the day and each of those times say, how happy are you at this moment? In fact, there's a really interesting study where they gave men proctological exams, which are very unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And half the group, they stopped at the end of the exam, and the other half of the group, they gave them an additional two minutes of this exam, but that additional two minutes was much less bad than the exam itself. Okay, so both groups had this, the same exam, but half of the, but one of the groups had an additional bad but not as bad exam. Yes, and okay. the group that had the additional amount, you should s expect that they would have had a worse experience because they got the exam plus the additional amount. But right. in fact, they reported having a better experience and being more likely to go get another practical exam really? in the future. So th people's... Um, what was how, how did you define the two ways of, of the two time experiential frame? versus experiential versus memory yeah. memory right so so measuring happiness with a memory based approach is very um, recently weighted or like the people's evaluations are like incredibly heavily weighted towards what they just experienced I guess mm -hmm. so you could have a rotten week and then it ends well and you're like that was a good week right or the, yeah. or you could watch a movie and you, your opinion of it could be tainted by just the ending of it totally yeah. So, and oh, I actually just thought of another study. Um, people uh, who have kids versus people who don't, when you ask them, like in the, the memory based approach, how happy have you been, like since you've had kids, the people with kids will say that they're much happier. They've been much happier than the people who didn't have kids say they are. But then if you, if you take the experiential approach and you ask them just minute to minute, how ha happy are you right now? Okay, right now, right now. And you do that for both groups. The people with kids are actually less happy on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is hugely problematic for coming up with any sort of reliable, standardizable system for measuring happiness. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's another important problem with measuring happiness, which is that how happy you think you are with your life is you're sort of measuring it relative to what you think you could be or what, what you think your life could be um so if well there, there was a study that was reported a couple years ago that that seemed to show that women with more education were less happy in their marriages and so conservatives obviously trumpeted this result as see you know all these liberal colleges are are um uh, instilling feminism in women and the feminism is hurting them. It's making them less happy. We told you. Um, and a favorite blogger of mine, uh, Kevin Drum, uh, re reported the study and said, you know, that's possible. Or what's happening is that with more education, women, uh, they raise their expectations of what a marriage could be. They expect more out of a marriage. And so um, they're, they're more dissatisfied with what they have because they're measuring it relative to what they know they could have. So I'm actually not quite sure how to think about this, though, because in a sense, well, how is it, how are you worse off if you now have higher expectations? But in another sense, you are actually worse off if you feel more dissatisfied, right? Yeah, well, people's happiness can be very influenced by their expectations. I mean, if you go to, to a movie and you expect it to be all right, and it is all right, you might feel fine about the experience, right. at least um, in your memory, you'd feel fine about the experience. Whereas if you were expecting it to be the best movie you've ever seen, mm -hmm. you may well feel disappointed, which is actually a negative emotion. Right. Although now that I think of it, the women, the less educated women who reported being happier in their marriages, that that's not necessarily experiential happiness. Maybe they actually are. I mean, if they're in very unequal marriages or marriages where they're treated poorly mm -hmm. in so those are would be cases, I guess, where the more educated women, because they have higher expectations, would report being very unhappy. The less educated women, and of course these are huge generalizations, but just for the purposes of this ex example, um, the less educated women might actually be equally unhappy on sort of a moment-to-moment -moment basis. But when you ask them how happy are you, um, because they, they they sort of look at their life and they and they, it's not obvious to them that it there's any way in which it could be better and so they'll say well yeah i'm very happy with my life so that's that's totally different from what they're actually feeling on a moment-to-moment -moment basis mm -hmm. that, that's tricky too well you know another possible interpretation of the study is it may have have differences in reporting women oh, who so. are less educated could there may be more of a taboo against reporting that you're unhappy oh right and so it's very again it's very hard to tell right so uh japan is a good example of that um, it's pretty taboo in Japan to uh, say you're not happy. And so that's, that's another cross-cultural problem in, mm -hmm. um, in reporting happiness across cultures.